Anyways. All right. We are live streaming on Facebook. Joe Stenovic, thank you again for joining us. Certified financial planner. Uh, we are going to have some people trickling in here, I think. Um, let me. Thanks for having me back on. Oh, of course. Um, it's not showing. Yeah. We'll just get started on it, I guess. Uh, I'm not sharing a screen or anything, so uh, this will be just fine. So, uh, Joe, thanks for joining us. Uh, again, appreciate it. We talked, uh, what was it, last week, I think, about the state of the economy, the state of the market. This, uh, this coronavirus is kind of changing things every single week. I've asked you, I've called you, I don't even know how many times to ask you about different things. Um, let's start off on uh, where are we in relation to last week? Are we in kind of the same spot? Is it still wait and see for the market? Is it still pretty volatile? What, what's going on? Yeah, so um, I think the last time I was on, it was a little less than two weeks ago. And um, overall, the market in terms of volatility, it's continuing to drop, meaning the market is kind of melting higher, um, which obviously is a good thing. And, you know, the question is the why. Anyway, we kind of talked about this the last time I was on, and uh, there could be any number of reasons why the market is going up. Like we talked about the Fed and the accommodative stance that they're taking, um, the expectations that this thing kind of passes at some point later this year. Um, but if you look at some of the economic data that's been coming out, you know, a lot of it is on a lag. So like, yesterday or no today excuse me this morning the weekly unemployment unemployment numbers came out and unfortunately another 3.3 million people filed for unemployment last week so there's a little bit of a lag when those numbers come out but what is good i guess the silver lining with these weekly unemployment claims is that each week they've been coming down so if you look at when this you know at like peak virus time when we went into shutdown back in, um, I guess, March, towards the end of March, the, the worst unemployment claim was 6.6 .6 million approximately in one week. Yeah. Um, and so every single week since then, the number has been coming down. And that could be for a number of factors, but I think one of them is because the, the PPP loans, so the, the pay Paycheck Protection Program, which was designed for small businesses, which in small businesses are a humongous factor in terms of the economic activity around the US, mm -hmm. that money is starting to trickle in to small businesses. And they're starting to, you know, I think bring some of those employees back onto payroll. Okay. Um, and they're also realizing that maybe they didn't need to let people go. Uh, and so that's all good on the, on the employment front. I think that's part of it. I think that, you know, those, those do sound promising. It's a, it sounds like a, about a half of a cut from what the highest point was for unemployment. However, we still need to sell our products and our services and things like that. So without a full open, we won't really know. And I think that's kind of what we're getting to is that we're not going to know the economic in, impact of this until we go to a full open and see what it looks like then. Because yeah. we're still shut down, albeit partially in some parts of uh, the country are open and, you know, some parts are not. So I think we're going to know a little bit more, it seems like, in the next uh, maybe month. Yeah, I, oh, for sure. Now, um, a couple other things to point out uh, with this economic data that I think is going to continue to improve. If you look at back in 2009, just to take a trip down memory lane for a second, um, and I'll bring it back, but in 2009 at the time, um, Ben Bernanke was the Federal Reserve Chair. Mm -hmm. who today that's Jerome Powell. In 09, he mentioned, he brought up the term what's called green shoots, which basically is a term that's been used over the course of economic history when you start to see positive signs of things turning around. Okay. So he brought that up. He mentioned that term in 09. He got a ton of backlash from it. And I, I'm not saying Jerome Powell came out and said there's green shoots, but there are a couple things that you're starting to see that I think are positive that you're not gonna, you're not gonna hear about in the media. Yeah, so yeah. Um, just a couple of quick facts. I wrote these down for y'all. So hotel occupancy rates over the last week are up significantly. Uh, rail car traffic up significantly. TSA checkpoints. So for, for perspective, TSA checkpoints a year ago 
were around 2.2 million per day. So at the peak of all of this, TSA checkpoints were down to 85,000. So you went from 2.2 million to 85,000, which is just mind blowing. But TSA checkpoints are up almost 100% over the last week. Okay. So that's good. I mean, you're coming from a, an incredibly low base of 85,000, but we're moving in the right direction. Well, and that might be, and this isn't really, I guess, a question for a financial advisor or a certified financial planner, but this is more of a question for, you know, uh, maybe a psychologist or are we just getting sick of the quarantine, you know, and that, that's something we can get into on a <laughs> philosophical level at a, a later point. So we don't need to get into it now. The main thing I want to talk about with you is the, the economy and the market. And it seems like we had a drop, but we had a bounce. And we talked about that bounce because we think, you know, it's, it's probably because we threw a lot of money towards it. And the government has thrown a lot of money, you know, at small businesses, stimulus, uh, big businesses, mid-sized businesses. Is this, and it's kind of been a rally since the lowest point. Is that not right? Yeah. And yeah, so, so is that rally sustainable or are we in for maybe another drop soon or can we tell? Yeah. So history, if we use history as a guide and I don't, and I hope we're not, I'm not repeating myself from last time, but I think, I don't think we talked about this, but usually what happens when you have a recession and you see the market bounce the way that we've seen um, since the bottom on right around, you know, March 22nd, March 23rd, something like that. So uh, you go from kind of complacency to extreme fear. We were fairly, the market was fairly complacent, you know, mid February, uh, extreme fear by the third week of March. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see the snapback because you realize, ah, oh, this might be overdone. What we've seen historically is the market, rally but then test those lows again when you are in a bear market okay. so you know you 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 people may have heard the term over the last couple of weeks bear market bounce mm -hmm. which is basically like the snapback that we're seeing but we're going to retest the lows i don't know i mean because we've not we've never seen the market drop as fast as we did back in march you sure. know so we're not and we are in a place today that we've never been we have never shut down the economy the yeah. way that we have so, you know, we, you put those two recipes together, those things together, the, the, the historical shutdown with the historical stimulus, is it different this time? It, you know, it might be, you know, but I have, I have no idea. Well, I, I saw the news that, uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Warren Buffett is sitting on $130 billion in yeah. cash and he was waiting to land a, a whale or something big, some big company. And then the news came out that he, didn't really buy anything. He actually bought some airline stock and then sold some airline stock mm -hmm. at a loss because, and, and a lot of people are looking at that as a, some kind of signal that maybe it's going to go down even further. So I listened to his shareholder meeting, which was eerie because the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting, it's held in Omaha where Berkshire's uh, corporate headquarters are. Every year it's a big deal for investors yeah. because anybody that owns a Berkshire share can go to his annual meeting. Yeah. And it was eerie in the sense that it was basically a camera on Warren Buffett and one of his colleagues and an empty giant room yeah. of him talking. So and, different than normal. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was odd in the sense that he's 89 years old. And so he's probably towards the end of his career, you know, as the most famous investor. But yeah, he was talking about how you know, he sold his airline stocks. And this, this is a good, this is a good lesson for any investor is that, you know, you might be wrong. Yeah. And if you're wrong. You take your loss and you move on, yeah. you know, and that's exactly what Warren Buffett did with the airlines. And now he did not put really any money to work. He didn't see any businesses that were uh, available to buy at a, or at least invest in at a, at a reasonable valuation. And I, you know, this is me speculating, but I think part of it was because this all happened so fast mm -hmm. that there was no opportunity. The, the combination of the speed of the drop and with the federal stimulus, those two things in combination made it probably really hard for Berkshire and, and him to put a fair value on a business. Yeah. And then therefore invested it. And so instead of taking a risk, you know, a calculated risk, yeah. deciding, you know what, let's, we're going to sit on our cash our cash pile 
and probably wait for things to kind of unfold over the next year. And then, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that cash pile, you know, between now and a year from now. That may, and that makes a lot of sense too. And also anyone who's watching Facebook or on Zoom, uh, if you have a question, please drop your question in uh, and we'll be sure to ask Joey too. Otherwise, Joey and I are just going to keep on talking about the market and what's going on. Um, so, and also if you're on Facebook, make sure you like it, share it, comment, all that stuff. So it, you know, gets the Facebook algorithm and gets it all out there to anyone else. Um, and I noticed that Warren needed a haircut, by the way, too, watching that shareholder meeting. He's, his hair was just like... So, so do I. You would think that Warren Buffett would have his own stylist come to the house, but you know, yeah, <laughs> he's a pretty frugal guy. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's sitting on a lot of cash and a lot of people look at that lack of, uh, you know, he, a lot of people thought that he's just going to jump into something, but he's not like that. He's very pragmatic and he's slow oh, yeah. in his approach. He's looking at the numbers. So I'm not really surprised. I'm surprised that he bought airline stock. I'm not surprised that he hasn't made a big buy of a company. And we were just talking earlier, there's a couple of companies already filing chapter 11, I think, or uh, what? Yeah, what I mean, it? so first off, it is a sad day for me, okay? I'm a, I'm a native San Diegan, and we just found out that Sioux Plantation is closing. I saw that. Which is just depressing, you know? Right. And, I mean, I know there's a lot of bad things going on, but- We used you know, to go there as kids. Uh, all the time, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so that's a big bummer. And I mean, I, understandably, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of people that probably aren't gonna be comfortable going to a, bu a buffet for a long time. But uh, Neiman Marcus filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy and J. Crew, uh, yeah. two retailers that I think were already struggling going into this. So any companies that are already struggling going into this are probably gonna end up filing Chapter 11. That doesn't mean they're going away. Yeah. You no, know, they're still gonna be operating, but that just means they're renegotiating yeah. on the debt. Yeah, and I think that we're going to see, we mentioned this last time we talked, we're going to see a big change in the brick and mortar retail stores. Anyways, we were moving towards that. This is accelerating everything. Uh, I still feel like we're going to see a big drop in, in retail or commercial real estate um, in the commercial real estate sector. Um, retail, I think, is going to have to adapt or die just uh, as you know we're kind of seeing now. Uh, Amazon, I think, might be a good play, financially speaking, for long term. Um, just because it's, uh, it facilitates consumer goods and that's what we're going to be losing a lot of like Radio Shack's gone, you know, Circuit City's gone, all these big electronic companies, you just get it on the internet now. So, yeah. uh, no, and that's not changing anytime soon. Um, let's pivot to another thing. Um, it, say you have someone who is a little bit older, you know, and maybe starting to think about retirement. Um, what are some what are some thoughts about retirement in, and obviously no crystal ball. So these are all hypotheticals, but if you're a few years out from retirement, you might be thinking, well, I don't know if I can retire. What's the first thing you should do? Um, well, yeah, I mean, everybody that is in that position is probably kind of questioning, well, have things changed, you mm -hmm. know? So I think that one of the, one of the best things that you can do if you're a couple of years away from retirement is, is to take, stock of your cash flow okay your expenses start with your expenses what is your monthly outflow and what do you think that your monthly outflow is going to be when you actually do stop working and i think one of the big misconceptions there's a lot of rule of thumbs out there around you know you need to have uh you you, you need to have uh 70 of your your employment income saved you need to be able to generate 70 percent of your employment income in, in retirement income I mean, yeah, it's a good rule of thumb, but I think it's very different for everybody, you know, but the, the best starting place is going to be looking at your cash flow, looking at your expenses and what do you expect your expenses to look like between now and retirement and the, when you do retire. Okay. Um, so that's the best place to look, a, a starting point. Second, look at what your retirement income uh, levers are. So social security, when's the last time you looked at your social security benefit statement? Uh, you should log on to ssa.gov and actually review your earnings history on your social security statement because there may be an error on there. So you need to review that every year, all of your earnings history going back to when you first started working are on your social security statement. What is your social security benefit? Are you confident in your social security claiming strategy? So that's the second point. And then looking at other retirement income sources uh, like pensions, your guaranteed type retirement income sources, your pensions and your social security. Uh, and then take stock of your investments and what's your strategy today. Um, and what does it mean for you if we do go down another 30% from here and your portfolio drops 20%, 
you know, what does it mean for your retirement plan? Can you, are you still on track to retire in two years based on the other inputs, the cash flow and those other income sources? And so like what, maybe adjusting your, the, the amount of years it might take if you do have to take a 20% loss or something to that effect. Um, yeah. And it sounds like uh, essentially evaluate your plan or have a plan if you don't yeah. have one in place. Okay. Right. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on too. Um, but I, I, I guess, and again, if anyone has any questions, I don't see any questions so far. Um, if you do have questions, make sure to mention them in the comment section and I, we will have Joey answer them right here on the spot or Joe answer them, sorry. Um, so that I think the, the market is, uh, it's very volatile. Has it not been for the last month or two? Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about non-traditional investments like Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. What are your thoughts about, uh, and uh, Bitcoin is known for being extremely volatile and it has recently been on the rise. Uh, and we talk about this all the time. I, I know you're not a huge fan. I'm a big fan, but let's talk about it. What are your thoughts? So I have to just start with my first rule of investing. Okay. Okay. For me personally, and I think anybody should probably go with this rule is don't invest in anything that you don't understand. Okay. And for me, I think it starts with a lack of understanding. Okay. Makes sense. First, and we can talk off air and I, and I've started to wrap my brain around how Bitcoin works. Okay, good. That's, that's rule number one. Yep. And let me just, let me just point one thing out and then I'll let you, uh, you can interject, but back in what year was it when Bitcoin really started taking off, uh, 2017 was it? I can't remember. Uh, but you, I started seeing people asking online on social media how to invest in Bitcoin because yeah. everybody saw it's going to the moon. And that's when I was thinking to myself, nobody understands this thing. It's brand new. You're going to get, you're going to get wiped out. Lo and behold, Bitcoin proceeded to drop, I don't, whatever percent, 80% or something like that after it hit its high or around there. Yeah. But it has come back quite a bit. And, you know, to me, the reason for that is because, you know, there's a lot of money that is being printed and pushed into circulation now. And so people are looking at this as an alternative currency to traditional yeah. dollars. Um, so, but, but beyond that, I don't think I understand it enough to sit here and say, ah, I have a, my, my take on Bitcoin is this. So. Well, and I've been following it for a while and I, I'm, it's one of, uh, it's one thing that I keep a close eye on and one, okay. So there's a couple of highlighted portions of Bitcoin and there's some downsides too. Uh, downside is it's not something you can use freely in the open market. You can't just go buy things very easily with Bitcoin. I understand that. Um, it's not that easy to understand. Sometimes it's hard to uh, access as, a, as opposed to just a regular bank account or, or cash. The good part about Bitcoin is that there's a finite amount. There, once you get to a certain amount of Bitcoins, 21 million, you never get any more. So the value will intrinsically go up uh, uh, because of that as a result. Um, there, it's not manipulatable by uh, a central government. When we do something like quantitative easing and, and flooding the market with all this cash, like we just did, we just printed trillions of dollars. The value of our dollar is gonna go down. Eventually it's gonna go down as a result of it. That can't be done with Bitcoin. So I think that it's, you know, it has people looking at non-traditional uh, invest, investments, especially with the uncertainty in the market. and. I, I, you know, we talk about this all the time and there are safer ways to kind of invest without buying a whole Bitcoin because it's running at about almost $10,000 a coin right now. But there are stocks that you can buy on like your Fidelity account that uh, are pegged to Bitcoin too. It's just that with the, the, one of the main deterrents of Bitcoin is the volatility. But we're now seeing a lot of extreme volatility in our stock exchange as well. Do you think, and this is ultimately the question I wanted to get to, I had all that prepped beforehand, but do you think that the volatility that we're seeing right now will be, will stay? Or do you think that it's going to go back to a little bit more of a slower pace, what it used to be as soon as the Rona leaves in maybe yeah. six months or a year? Question. Yeah, I would say that the volatility that we experienced in February and March was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Like that, that is not normal volatility for the stock market. You know, uh, the majority of market moves are on average per day are less than 1% mm -hmm. in either direction. And I mean, there were days where the market moved 13% in either direction. 
That is abnormal volatility. But given the circumstances, although abnormal, you know, historically speaking, given the given the environment and what we were encountering, yeah, I think uh, looking back, it was normal, just based on the circumstances. But I don't think that it's going to be. We're not, you know, depending upon what next exogenous event occurs. Yeah, yeah, we'll see volatility similar to that. But you know, maybe maybe uh, normal wouldn't be the the operative term. Maybe something that's more like acceptable or like expected uh, given the situation and the circumstance. Like if we, if we all of a sudden, you know, went to war, like in 9-11, it was extremely volatile afterwards because it was, a, it was a catastrophic event that caused, you know, wild movements. And I think that, you know, plus or minus five to 10 to 20 or 15%, that's not sustainable when it comes to people's yeah. retirements. And so yeah. we're gonna, the market I think will evolve from all of this and it usually does. Um, and, and me personally, this is obviously your, your you know, field, um, but it, I think it has to evolve back to a slow incremental, uh, very less, uh, a lot less volatile than what it is. Yeah, yeah, and it will. You know, we will, as things start to normalize in the economy and things open back up, we're gonna see more, we're gonna see more normal volatility. And when I say normal volatility, what causes that? I mean, it could be any number of things. There's, there could be a, uh, uh, some sort of, headline event that causes volatility, such as, you know, back in, in uh, January, the, the bombing in Iran, that caused a little bit of market volatility, normal. Um, the other type of market volatility is gonna be around what happens with corporate profits, corporate earnings. Yeah. And I think what's interesting to point out right now in terms of not seeing a lot of volatility uh, around earnings, it, it is kind of interesting to me because the stock market follows earnings. Yeah. Companies. Every quarter, you know, whether good or bad, you know, this changed like 30 years ago, whether good or bad, you know, corporate executives, you know, their, their career or their job oftentimes is dependent upon stock performance, Yeah. you know? And so they're very much quarter by quarter driven to maximize profits and earnings. And every quarter, these companies come out with their earnings for the last quarter and they provide guidance or expectations for future quarters. But what we're, what's happening today is they are not even providing guidance for what they expect to happen in the next quarter or the quarter after that or the quarter after that. Yeah. And so that to me is a sign, you know, they don't know, they don't know what's going to happen with their profitability and their earnings. And I would expect that over the course of the, these coming months that we will start to see more volatility as a result of the lack of guidance from earnings. So with the guidance, doesn't that usually help analysts uh, project what they think the earnings will be per share, price per share, and this will make it a little bit harder. So yeah, I, I, that makes sense. If you, if you follow the logic, you know, usually they might say, okay, well, based on this guidance, we can project that this company is going to make 33 cents per earnings per share. And then it comes out and they made 50 or five. We have no idea yep. because we're not able to project based on what the CEOs or the officers are, are saying. So that makes sense. And that kind of brings me to the last one I was going to ask you about, which is Disney. And I know that you're not an individual stock guy as much as you are as a, a macro approach, but Disney had a massive drop in sales and revenue. And what happened? Stock. I think the stock went up, didn't it? How? I think probably because the expectations, like I've probably talked about before, is the, everything is driven by expectations. Yeah. The expectations were so bad for Disney. That and it was priced in? That it was priced in. And what, is that, what does priced in mean? You know? Priced in, well, I, I guess for anyone watching who doesn't know what priced That's, in means, yeah. to me, I would say that priced in means that it's expected. Like we, or we, yeah. any news that's coming up is already expected and the price already reflects that news. There you go. Perfect. So. Good. That's a good explanation. So the bad news was already priced in to Disney. Yeah. And unless, and those, ex, a lot of these expectations, you know, cause we're, we are in the middle of, we've been in earnings season for the first quarter and the expectations have been awful. Yeah. You know, and some have been better, but done better than expectations. Some have done worse. And, um, in Disney's case in particular, I think the expectations were so low mm. that the, the market probably kind of took a sigh of relief. Yeah. Looking at Disney and saying, okay, 
Disney's not going away. Yeah, profits were down, I think like 90% or something like that. But, you know, there is, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I think maybe part of it is just because uh, economy's starting to open back up, states are starting to open back up, which is a whole nother conversation. And I think that once, it, for me, it's gonna be like a pendulum almost, it's gonna swing back and forth because once the economy starts to open back up, we're gonna see a rush of profits, a rough, a rush of the economy kind of feeling like it's flourishing, but it's not really yet. It's just in comparison to our lowest level. So exactly. I think those corporate earnings are gonna be bad for a while. And then we'll slowly get back into it. And not to mention, we're not even talking about the what $25 trillion that the US economy or the US government owes now. We're not paying that off. Yeah, that no it comes way. up a lot with clients that, you know, the, I mean, the, the silver lining there is that the interest rates are very low, you know, um, yeah. and, and you are hearing uh, talk of a stimulus, an infrastructure package. You know, and if the government's going to borrow money, this is probably as good a time as any to borrow money on, on a long term basis because you can borrow it at such such low rates. But what does that do to the future? You know, that that is a whole nother conversation in of itself. How are we going to dig out of it? You know, mm -hmm. don't borrow, but don't borrow money to buy Bitcoin because that's what people were doing in 2017. Ah, there you go. And that's part of the reason why. Okay. Yeah. It's true. I was, I was watching this while it happened because I started investing in cryptocurrencies in 2016 uh, ish. And uh, I remember seeing on forums, people were taking out loans. Uh, they were refinancing their houses to buy Bitcoin. They bought it at 18, 19, $20,000 at the highest point. It went down to 4,300 most recently oh. a few months ago, yeah. but it's back up to 10,000. It looks like it's on its way back up. Uh, We'll, we'll keep talking about it over the, the months here because I have a feeling it's going to go up to maybe six figures. We'll see. I know you're not a big fan, but well, I'll, I'll make you a believer one of these days. All right. All right. Um, okay. So it looks right like uh, we don't really have any questions. Now, Joey, we talked about uh, having a plan. And for anyone who is watching or, or seeing this video who doesn't necessarily have a plan, can you help them? Yeah. Absolutely. So if anybody has any questions about their plan or wants a second opinion or whatever, you know, based on what they're doing, um, you know, I'm happy to have a conversation. You can reach out, you can send me an email, send me a message through Facebook because uh, I'll, I'll be tagged in this, in this video. Mm -hmm. um, and we can jump on the phone and just have a quick conversation about what's on your mind and if you're worried about anything and, uh, and go from there. Yeah. I think one of the things that I like that, you know, uh, legal side plan, financial side plan, that's you. And uh, having a plan in place is so important. I think that the, the Corona uh, pandemic has shown a little, shine a little bit of light on people's uh, plan or not, you know, having a full robust plan in place. And it's so important to have, and you, you got to constantly evaluate and retool it and make sure that it's doing exactly what you want it to do. So I'll make sure to tag you and put your email because I know your email has a bunch of hyphens and dashes and colons and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I put the email in there, yeah. yeah and I'll make sure that people can click on that um, and if someone can reach out to you directly. Uh, so if, I think that's all. Do you have any uh, any other things that you want to tell anyone? Any kind of last- um, Green shoots, green shoots. That's what we're looking for. You know, okay. so hopefully we, we start to see the economy start to open back up um, and hopefully the cases doesn't, don't spike. Uh, cause if they do, then, you know, hopefully we don't have to start this thing all over again, but that would green be is really important. So, uh, green shoots, like, uh, would a green shoot be construction starting a new construction, new construction, people starting to fly. Like I was saying with those stats, you know, more, more folks being comfortable getting on airplanes, people staying in hotels. Yeah. Those are signs that the economy is starting to open back up. That'd be good. Okay. Well, I'll keep an eye out for some green shoots and, uh, Pass along any questions. Remember, uh, Justin at lawyerandbluejeans.com. If you have any questions you want me to pass along to Joe, we're going to be putting up his information on the show notes and in the Q&A as well, too. Uh, so that way you can click on this. Email me if you want me to send you this, uh, the link to this video so you can watch it at a later point or send to someone else. We're going to try and do these uh, every week, every other week, where we get a kind of a market update. That way you can ask any financial questions. It's not it's not very often you can ask an attorney a question for free or a certified financial planner a question for sure. free too. So we want to have this out there for you in, in case you have questions. You don't want to pay. You don't, you're afraid to go into an office or whatever. Uh, we're here for uh, 
at this forum basically to make sure that your questions are answered. So, uh, Joe, thank you again for joining us, and uh, we'll see you in the next week or two. All right. Thanks, Justin. Take All care, right. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Make sure to like and share on Facebook, and uh, we'll see you next week for Brad Seaman and Jason Yoss talking about a new bill that might reduce tenants' rent by 25%. We'll wow. see you next Monday. We'll talk about that. Have a good day. Bye.